Welcome back to another science video. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're learning more about waves, and specifically, what about earthquake waves? Now, when we say earthquake waves, let's think about how earthquakes start. Now, here's a, a very simple a diagram of, of how that works. Um, we know that earthquakes actually begin deep in the earth, and the point at which the earthquake actually starts is called the focus. That's the actual uh, beginning point of an earthquake. Now, normally at the focus, there are fault lines, there are perhaps uh, fissures or cracks in the Earth's crust that are grinding against each other. Now, when that happens, that releases a huge amount of energy. It's almost unimaginably large to think about how much energy is released when this earthquake happens. These, this, these faults are grinding against each other and at the moment that that happens, at the focus, there are body waves that radiate directly through the Earth in all directions. And so that's what's symbolized here by these concentric circles. These body waves are radiating out. These body waves are very, very fast. We'll talk about how fast they are here in just a second. Now, some of those body waves actually go up to the surface and the epicenter of an earthquake is the point on the Earth's surface that's directly above the focus of the earthquake. And so when you hear about the epicenter, that is, that's what it's talking about. That's the point directly above the focus of the earthquake. Now the focus is deep inside the Earth there. So there, there's a difference. The focus is inside the Earth. The epicenter is on the Earth's surface. Now, when we talk about these body waves, these are waves that are moving very, very quickly. There are mainly two types of body waves that we're going to talk about in this uh, series of videos here. Primary waves, and there are secondary waves. Let's talk about the primary waves first. We call those uh, uh, P waves, and these are pressure waves. These pressure waves are basically pushing and uh, uh, pulling on the rock and the liquid that are in the Earth. And these are the fastest waves that are emitted from an earthquake. Like I said earlier, these body waves, and especially these primary body waves, P waves, are very, very fast. They travel between three miles per second and six miles per second. And so imagine at the, almost as soon as that earthquake takes place at the focus, these body waves are flying out of there, essentially, and they're the first waves to be de detected by seismographs. As a result, once those P waves are felt by a seismograph, we actually are able to detect those. Now, you as a human usually cannot feel a P wave. That's something that most people cannot feel. However, seismographs can, and this is actually the basis of, of a certain type of warning system. This is called an Earthquake Early Warning System, or EEW. And Earthquake Early Warning Systems have been uh, developed in several different countries around the world. Mexico is one of those, and in the description I have a link to a video that shows uh, an actual live TV footage of, the, of an Earthquake Early Warning System actually detecting an earthquake in Mexico not uh, too many years ago. Uh, these earthquake early warning systems are able to detect an earthquake usually about somewhere between 15 seconds and a minute or so before people actually feel the shaking. That may not seem like much, but that is a huge amount of time if we're talking about moving to a safe place. That can be the difference between maybe just a small number of casualties and maybe tens of thousands of casualties as we've seen in some other places. Now what about other countries? Well, uh, where I'm recording this video in the United States, there are uh, some earthquake early warning systems that are in the development phase at the time that I'm recording this video in the year 2021, but other countries have them and they are in use, such as Japan. Uh, Turkey is another country that uses earthquake early warning systems, and they are quite effective. Now, occasionally there are some false alarms, but very often these systems are able to save uh, often thousands of lives when they are able to catch a real earthquake. Now, 
when you talk about the other type of body wave, these are called secondary waves. These are shear waves that are moving rock up and down or from side to side. And the, one of the main differences is between the P waves and S waves, S waves only move through solid rock. Notice that these P waves can actually go through liquid as well, right? But secondary waves only go through solids. That's one of the differences between the P and the S waves. Now, S waves travel pretty quickly, but not as fast as the P waves. They travel uh, between about 0.6 miles per second and 4 miles per second. And these are the second waves to be picked up by seismographs. And so once those S waves hit you, uh, you can probably feel those. And so that's usually the, uh, the shaking that you will feel at the beginning of an earthquake. Now, let's take a look and see what these actually are. This is a P wave or a diagram of a P wave moving through the surface of the earth. This is what that looks like. And so maybe you've seen a slinky. If you take a slinky and extend it and just like push on the slinky and watch that movement go through, that's kind of what you have here. That's a P wave. And as those travel through the earth, most of the time, humans can't feel those. Now, I'm not saying that no one can feel those, but we are pretty sure that animals can detect those. Uh, sometimes animals go pretty wild about a minute or so before an earthquake starts. Uh, there's some evidence to believe that animals can maybe detect something even before that. We don't know for sure, but uh, there's some evidence to, uh, to that effect. There's a lot we don't know. But we know that P waves can be de detected, at least by seismographs, about 10 or 15 to 60 seconds before the actual big shaking of an earthquake starts. Now, this type of wave that you see here, this is called a longitudinal wave. When we talk about the, the, the main types of waves because of the way that these the wave energy is being displaced. It's actually being displaced along. So that's what we call it, longitudinal. It's going along the same direction as that wave is moving or as it's propagating. So it's like a, a slinky that's being pushed, as you can see there. It's just going through. Now, what about S waves? S waves are different. Here's what an S wave looks like. Now, this is what you're probably usually thinking of when you think of an earthquake. This is kind of what you think of, like this rolling type of movement here, the S waves. And this is usually what causes the big shaking that you feel at the beginning of an earthquake. So this would be like if you take a slinky and you just kind of, you know, jostle it up and down. And it causes that shaking to be transmitted through. And that's a, that's a type of wave that we call a transverse wave. Because notice that the wave uh, displaces perpendicular to the direction that the wave is propagating. So in order to create that transverse wave on a slinky, you don't push the slinky, you have to move it up, you know, up and down. And then that, uh, that wave goes along the slinky, but it goes, you know, through, so it's perpendicular. So those are S waves, and you can feel those. Now, we call those two body waves. The P waves and S waves are both body waves. Probably can't feel the P waves, probably can feel the S waves. Now, surface waves are what arrives after the body waves. Now, why do surface waves arrive later? Well, it's because of the way that they're transmitted. Body waves, these S and P waves, are going directly through the Earth. So imagine this. Now, this is a little bit exaggerated. You know, usually uh, the seismograph doesn't have to be a quarter of the way around the Earth. You know, usually it might be just a maybe 100 miles away or even less than that even. Or I think it could be more. But either way, those waves travel directly through the Earth. And so as you can see, they're able to get to the seismograph and I guess to the uh, place where the Earth is shaking a lot more quickly. So that's why those P waves can be picked up, you know, very, very quickly and S waves pretty quickly as well. But surface waves have to travel from Notice, they don't travel from the focus. The surface waves travel from the epicenter, which is on the surface of the Earth. And it has to travel around the surface of the Earth. That's why they're called surface waves, right? That kind of makes sense. And since the Earth is round, it takes longer 
for those surface waves to get there. They're also slower just because of the way that they propagate. And so surface waves take a, a bit longer to get to the, the, the place where the, the Earth's going to be shaking, or, or to you, you know, if you're standing in a certain place. Now, when we talk about destruction, surface waves are actually responsible for most of the destruction in an earthquake. Here's what that looks like. Now, notice what's shaking here. It's the surface. It's, this is what causes that twisting motion. Notice that this is different because in the uh, S waves that we saw earlier, it was something it was going all the way through, just like a slinky does. Well, notice this is not the whole thing that's moving. It's just the surface. And so that's why there's so much destruction there, is because there's this twisting, this turning motion, and that's what causes most of the shaking during an earthquake, especially during the middle and, and toward the end of that earthquake. Sometimes these are called Rayleigh waves, as you can see. And these do move the slowest, so they move somewhere between 0.2 and 1.5 miles per second. Now, let's take a look at some of the damage or some of the different earthquakes that have taken place. Oh, by the way, tsunamis are a type of surface wave as well. So when there's an earthquake, uh, you know, sometimes that goes right up to the surface uh, in the ocean, and especially if the epicenter is in the ocean, and then that tsunami can propagate from there and cause uh, quite a bit of damage as it uh, hits the, the shore. Now, earthquakes have caused lots of damage throughout history. Uh, we can take a look at, for example, this earthquake uh, and this is the one that took place in San Francisco, California, back in 1906. This was a magnitude 7.9, we believe. And as it turns out, you know, a lot of shaking, but actually much of the damage was caused from the fires after the earthquake as well. So a very destructive earthquake, but the fires actually uh, made a, a bad situation even worse. We can take a look at this situation here that took place in Anchorage, Alaska and the area around there in 1964. Now look at the magnitude on the Richter scale here, 9.2. This was a, an extremely uh, powerful earthquake, uh, an unimaginably large amount of energy here. Look at what happened to this street here. We actually have places where the, the road seemed to you know cave down. Looks like it fell in some places. There are cars. I mean, you can't drive away from that. Maybe it was lifted in other areas. Uh, an extremely high amount of damage where you have the earth twisting and uh, a huge amount of movement. Um, at that time in Alaska, there weren't that many people living there. Uh, there was a huge amount of destruction, as you can see, although there, were a, there was a relatively uh, small amount of, a, of a fatalities uh, since there weren't as many people living there. If we take a look at this series of earthquakes that took place in New Madrid, Missouri, or I should say around New Madrid, Missouri, somewhere around 1811, around the, uh, the winter of 1811 and early into 1812, over a course of about uh, six to 12 weeks or so, there were three major earthquakes that took place. We think they were somewhere around 8.2 magnitude on the Richter scale. And these earthquakes were some of the most destructive that uh, took place this far away from the coasts. Um, for example, the, these formed sand geysers in Fulton County, Kentucky, and also in uh, the boot, what, what today is the uh, boot heel of uh, Missouri as well. There, there are still, over 200 years later, uh, places in the boot heel of Missouri where crops will not grow. Crops do not grow very well simply because the sand is still there from these sand geysers from those earthquakes over 200 years ago. There are still scars in the Earth's surface today that you can actually go and see. Now, for a short while, these earthquakes actually made, especially the last of those three earthquakes in 1812, made the Mississippi River flow backwards. And as a result, it actually formed Real Foot Lake in northwest Tennessee. Uh, when we think about earthquakes in the United States, we think about usually of California, sometimes the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, 
A lot of people don't think about the center of the country, Missouri, in this area. Um, you know, these earthquakes in 1811 and 1812 uh, caused rather a relatively f small number of uh, fatalities, but that was simply because of the low population that lived in that area at the time. If you think about today's population, you know, this is an area where there are basically five states that would be directly affected. We're talking about Missouri, uh, Western Kentucky, Northwest Tennessee, uh, northeastern Arkansas is very close, southern Illinois. And so all of these states kind of w would be directly affected. There are some major metropolitan areas not far from where this took place over 200 years ago. For example, Memphis, Tennessee is about 100 miles away from where this took place. It would be directly affected by another earthquake on this New Madrid fault zone. Uh, St. Louis is less than 150 miles away from where this took place. Other uh, smaller and regionally important communities like Murray, Kentucky, like uh, Paducah, Kentucky, like um, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, Carbondale, Illinois. These are places that would be directly affected by uh, an earthquake on this New Madrid fault zone, which, by the way, uh, according to evidence, that is out there, it seems like there are major earthquakes on this New Madrid fault zone every, you know, couple hundred years. And so uh, it may may happen again uh, relatively soon. So something to, to think about. And so earthquakes do cause damage. And so when we talk about early warning systems and things like this, uh, these are things that could save lives. Uh, earthquakes do damage. It's important to know about the types of waves to be able to know what to expect if and when you feel an earthquake. Hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you learned something from it about earthquakes and earthquake waves. If you did, please smash that like button and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. And if you'd like to be notified of my future videos, go ahead and ring that bell so that you are notified of that. Uh, thanks for joining me on my science channel, on my chemistry channel, and join me again where we can learn some more science together.